And welcome to this evening's conversation with our guest, uh, the anti-caste activist and the journalist Yashika Dab. My name is Arjun Gunaratna, and I'm, the, uh, I'm a professor of anthropology here at McAllister College. I will be facilitating this event along with my colleague from the University of Minnesota, Mr. Vishal Jankar. I would like to begin by honoring the fact that we are on Dakota land. This is the ancestral homeland of the Dakota people who were forcibly exiled from the land because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism. We make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota people, ancestors and descendants, as well as the land itself. McAllister sits near Badote, the sacred meeting point of the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers. In the words of the Reverend Jim Bear Jacobs, Badote is a place of genesis and genocide both realities alive in the land at once. We recognize that this acknowledgement itself is not enough and only serves as a first step towards decolonization. I also want to acknowledge the tremendous support those of us organizing this event have received from a number of institutions and people, both at McAllister and in the wider community. At McAllister, the event is sponsored by the Departments of Anthropology, Asian Languages and Cultures, Asian Studies, History, International Studies, Religious Studies, Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Political Science. And by the Institute for Global Citizenship, the Center for Religious and Spiritual Life, and the Provost's Office. The East Side Freedom Library, which is live streaming this event, the Institute for Global Studies and the Interdisciplinary Center for the Study of Global Change, both at the University of Minnesota, along with GV Films, an Indian film production company, and the Twin Cities South Asia Solidarity Collective, all have made it possible for us to bring Yashika Dutt to campus today. We are deeply grateful to all these organizations and to McAllister's provost, Lisa Anderson-Levy, for her support. This is an event not just for the McAllister community, but as this list of sponsors indicates, for the Twin Cities generally. We hope that this event will help to intensify efforts to have caste discrimination explicitly made illegal in our educational institutions, our workplaces, and in Minnesota more broadly. Before I introduce Ms. Dart, I would like to introduce my fellow facilitator at this event, Mr. Vishal Jankar who is a PhD student in public affairs at the University of Minnesota. He is engaged in praxis-based research on the issues of caste, indigeneity, natural resources, and the politics of development. He started his professional career as a chemical engineer in a lubricant company in Mumbai, India, but soon shifted to the nonprofit sector. For about 13 years, he worked as a community mobilizer with Dalit and Adivasi, that is indigenous community collectives in central India around issues of social justice, natural resource management, forest rights, and the right to work. And was an advisor on rural development programs to the government of India and the state governments of Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh. Like Ms. Dat, Mr. Jankar started exploring his Dalit identity after the death of the Dalit student Rohit Vemula in 2016. Since then, he has been voraciously reading, reflecting, writing on the issues of caste and indigeneity, and through these processes, trying to heal, to become a whole person from, as he puts it, his earlier broken, crushed, and scattered identity. This event is intended to be a conversation among the three of us, Ms. Dutt will read some excerpts from her book, and then Mr. Jamka and I do have some questions for her. And there'll be time for questions from the audience, so please have them ready. I do ask that you keep them brief and to the point. And to those watching on Zoom, please put your questions in the chat and put a big letter Q before them so that we can distinguish them from the comments. And we will do our best to get to them as well. And now let me introduce our speaker, Yashika Dutt. Yashika Dutt is a journalist and the award-winning author of the memoir, Coming Out as Dalit, which was recently awarded the Sahitya Akademi Yuva Puraskar 
in 2020. This is India's National Academy of Letters Young Writers Award, and this is among the country's highest literary honors. Her book is a meticulously scathing memoir that indicts the caste system and its brutal oppression of Dalits in today's India. And it is currently being taught at several universities across the United States. Her work has been published in the New York Times, Foreign Policy, and The Atlantic. And Ms. Dutt has been featured on the BBC, The Guardian, and PBS NewsHour. Born and raised in India, in the city of Ajmer in Rajasthan, she graduated from the Columbia School of Journalism and lives in New York. Yashika Dutt is recognized for highlighting Dalit rights globally, and her voice has been instrumental in understanding the realities of caste within the increasingly prominent Indian diaspora, especially in the United States, where caste discrimination in Indian immigrant communities is widespread. Her memoir recounts hers and her family's exhausting attempts to pass as high caste, to try to avoid the oppression they would otherwise face, and her realization after the suicide of the Dalit student Rohit Vemula that she could no longer pretend to be something she wasn't, but that she should instead own her identity and fight for it. Her book is not only a chronicle of her own journey, but a chronicle of the Dalit experience in modern India. To quote her, I am quote, this, this is a quote, I also didn't know that being Dalit would give me my voice, a voice that will make fellow Dalits reach out to say that they are not scared to come out now, a voice that would instigate such pitiful fear among fundamentalists that they would be forced to carry out a 24-hour hate tweet cycle to shut it up. A voice that I had used otherwise, but I was never as unfettered, assertive, or loudly heard as it was when I used it as Dalit. And we will hear that voice today. Rohit Vemula's story is told in the documentary film Reason, Vivek, by the great Indian filmmaker Anand Patwardhan, who was once a Humphrey professor here at McAllister. And we will be screening that film on campus on September 21st and 22nd. And you're all invited to that event as well. So I hope you will come to that. And now, please join me in welcoming Yashka Dutt to McAllister and the Twin Cities. Thanks, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first time in Minneapolis. That was way bigger than the introduction I sent you, so thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Vishal. It's rare that you get to share a stage with another Dalit person who has had the same journey, so I'm extremely honored that we will be in conversation today. I hope those of you on Zoom, all of you here, take away something really important from this conversation, take away an understanding of caste. Uh, before we get into the talking portion of the evening, I'd like to read a few sentences, paragraphs from this book. It's my well-worn copy of Coming Out as Dalit. The chapter that I'm about to read to you is called The Argument for Reservation. Now, reservation, for those of us who are non-South Asian, is the affirmative action policy that is in India. That is the only way that somebody like me is able to sit in front of you and speak the way I speak, write this book. It's because my grandfather was allowed to sit in the same class as upper caste students and that started a cycle that allowed me to move to the US and write and speak in English. So this chapter is called the Argument for Reservation I'll take you from the middle. After the protests died down, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare asked then University Grants Commission Chairman, Professor Subdeo Thorat, to look into the complaints of caste-based discrimination and abuse against the AIMS faculty and administration. Thorat's report was released in 2007 and found that 85% of SCST, which is scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, Dalit and Adivasi students, disclosed 
that they did not have proper access to faculty who were indifferent to them and paid more attention to their upper caste classmates in practical and viva exams. Almost 76% reported that examiners wanted to know their caste, and several students said that their grades dropped once it was known that they were from an SC or an ST, Dalit or Adivasi background. Around 88% of SCST students reported receiving fewer marks than they expected in theory papers. Postgraduate students complained that they were not assigned thesis guides, which made it difficult for them to access external academic opportunities like scholarships or conferences, especially abroad. SCSC students reported suffering abuse not only from their teachers, but also their peers who would bully them because of their lower caste. Students talked about revolting ragging practices when new students were forced to reveal the caste in front of all students and when discovered to be from a lower caste, senior students would yell invective and caste slurs, asking why they didn't choose to study elsewhere. SCST students would be forced to sit on the floor while others sat on hostel room beds because they had earned their seat by merit. SCST students would have to recite 10 reasons why I don't belong in Ames in this institution. SCSC students were abused both physically and verbally if they were unable to do that. These targeted hazing rituals ensured that even students from caste neutral backgrounds would become hyper aware of their differences, creating casteist hierarchies where they didn't exist before. These hazing rituals are designed so SCST students would start their years at Ames and their careers feeling inferior, while upper caste students held on to their sense of superiority. This kind of ragging, which is common in medical and engineering schools in India, is horrifically isolating and aims to dehumanize its victims so the oppressors would share no sympathy with them. They create to duplicate the original rules of the caste system of denying education to Dalits in modern India. Specific to Ames, which by the way is one of the largest medical colleges in India. Specific to Ames, these patterns of abuse and humiliation often follow SCSC doctors into their careers. Many of them, like Mumbai resident Dr. Rohan Kamble, who wrote into Documents of Dalit Discrimination, which is a blog that I started in 2016. Many of these students are terrorized into giving up their higher education. This also leaves a lasting impact on the students' mental health, as many of them come from poorer backgrounds. They find it impossible to thrive in this kind of a toxic academic environment. Of the 16 Dalit student suicides in North India between 2007 and 2013, two were at Ames. Balmukun Bharti had topped his school in Bundelkhand and scored a high rank in the IIT entrance examination, which he had given up to join Ames. Bharti belonged to the Chamar community. Chamar community is a community of lower caste, like myself, Dalit folks who deal with dead animals, who deal with leather. He came from Kundeshwar, a small village in Madhya Pradesh. He committed suicide in 2010 after repeated incidents of caste-based harassment. The college principal allegedly told him, you can never become a doctor because you don't have the brains. Dalit activist and documentary filmmaker Anup Kumar, in his documentary series, Death of Merit, interviewed Bharti's parents, who recalled their son's terrified reaction to the principal's diatribe. Despite the obvious harassment, the college administration refused to take any responsibility for his death. Instead, they blamed his lack of English language skills and his inability to cope with the coursework. Less than two years later, in 2012, another ST Adivasi student, Anil Meena, who was the second topper in the scheduled tri tribes category of the Ames exam, also killed himself. Kumar's documentary examines both their deaths and holds the college directly or indirectly accountable for them. But Ames doesn't seem to reserve its casteism for its students alone. The Dalit Adivasi faculty 
also complained of illegalities in their hiring and promotion, according to the Thorat Committee report. While Dalit professors were denied rifle promotions, the empty seats were filled from the general category applicants in a willful neglect of the mandatory reservation policy. The Ames administration dismissed the findings of the Thorat report, questioned its methodology, and called it biased and unsubstantiated. Allegations of discrimination and intimidation are not unheard of in other high, higher education institutions as well. Rohit Vemula, the student we talked about earlier, his death at Hyderabad University in 2016 was not a one-off. Eight Dalit students had committed suicide right there between 2006 and 2016 alone. Rohit's death has been categorized as institutional murder for many reasons. Chief among them being that many students believe that the university vice chancellor, Appa Rao Pori, had a history of casteist neglect and antagonism towards Dalit students, and many hold him directly responsible for Rohit's death. Hyderabad University, like Ames, encourages the isolation of Dalit students with the lack of meric scare tactics, like outing Dalit Adivasi students with a star under their name, even if they have not availed themselves of the reservation or affirmative action policy. Deepti Krishna, a PhD student at Hyderabad University, narrated her mother's ordeal in the, in the documents of Dalit discrimination, Tumblr. When her mother was a student there, decades ago, her roommates had set fire to her room. Terrified of a similar harassment, Krishna refused to avail herself of the reservation, even though she was entitled to it as a Dalit student. Like at Ames, in Hyderabad University as well, Dalit postgraduate students are frequently denied thesis guides and find the scholarships blocked. These scholarships for many students like Rohit not only supported them, but also helped sustain their families. Senthil Kumar, who had pursued a PhD despite his difficult financial background, committed suicide in 2008 when the university repeatedly denied him a guide and suddenly withdrew his fellowship. Kumar was from Salem, a small town in Tamil Nadu, and the entire family had worked hard to send him to college. He was the first in the family to pursue higher education. Like Rohit's mother, they depended on the money he sent home. It's not hard to imagine Kumar's helplessness and frustration that drove him to take his own life. Madari Venkatesh, another Dalit PhD student, had killed himself by consuming poison in 2013 when the Hyderabad University administration hadn't allowed him a permanent guide or a laboratory. Former Supreme Court Justice in India, K. Ramaswamy, reported in 2016 that these delays in allotting guides were based on ambiguous procedures and mostly affected Dalit Adivasi students in the university. Earlier in 2013, a group of 29 academicians had identified administrative indifference and hostile regulations as a cause of marginalized student suicides in Hyderabad University. But the university's administration asked for scientific proof for sociologist Sahij Hegre's analysis that students from marginalized backgrounds were alienated. All these universities seem to follow the same playbook on how to exclude Dalits. The academic performance of the students seems to be less important than their lower caste. Ragging, institutional bullying, and lack of support for Dalit students causes many of them to commit suicide and discourages other Dalits from applying to these important centers of learning, leading them to be further excluded from these fields. This sends a clear signal to young Dalit aspirants that these prestigious colleges have no place for them, regardless of what the reservation policy dictates. The toxic belief that quota students or reservation students are innately less able or talented than general category students is at the heart of this exclusion. So I focused a lot on student suicides and I fully understand how that can be triggering. 
But I do want to point out that it's important for us to talk about these issues because they're institutionally mechanized, especially against students who are Dalit, who are Adivasi, who are being told that they don't belong in these places specifically because of the backgrounds they come from. And I'd be happy to talk more about it, but I'd pass it on to Vishal now. Jai Bhim, Hul Johar, and hello. Let's reverse the order today. Uh, what an honor, Yashika, to be sitting beside you. Uh, it's a mutual uh, honor indeed. Uh, and this, this book uh, uh, that brings me here, I just briefly want to put it in context, in time and, and as a person. When I started my exploring my own identity, I was really looking forward to, you know, autobiographies by which I could relate to. Uh, because at one point of time, biographies used to be a way for Dalit people to exert their identities when they were not trained in big schools, they were not theorizing. I, I read like, coming from Maharashtra, read Daya Pawar, Baburao Bagul, even baby Kamli and Urmila Pawar, but I was still not finding my guru. Mostly these people came from Ambedkarite, Buddhist background, and they were kind of, you know, brought up that way having Dr. Ambedkar's photo in their, uh, in their main hall. That's when I came to uh, this book around 2018, and, and I would definitely say that the Ashika and this book represents that erstwhile scheduled caste people who grew up hiding their caste, like me. I, I grew up like that. My parents wanted me to hide their caste. Uh, and passing out as upper caste, right, saying I'm Maratha, I'm some kind of a Brahmin, and, but still insidiously experiencing these discriminations and mental trauma, either when your caste is outed by some of the other means, uh, or when you hear some blatant comments, like Aap bhangi ho, jai bhim wale ho, uh, abusing reservations, even it happens here, uh, segregating across, say, food hobbits, or even some of the well-meaning friends uh, saying that, oh, that discrimination doesn't exist. Why do you say that? And, but, but eventually you realize a misfit is there, that something is missing. You need to take up that identity, otherwise the whole world doesn't fit in. And probably that moment occurred to me, and this book helped me to relate to it, accept my privilege as a, as a cisgendered man. I guess there is a lot of things that I, would, I was able to relate to that, and I'm sure there are a lot many, even those who are here or maybe watching on Zoom, uh, friends of mine coming from Dalit and Adivasi, nomadic tribe background, who do not disclose their identity in their professional backgrounds. Fear of fear being outed because they were seen as less deserving uh, or not sharing a pedigree that mostly they see outside. I think this book represents all those people uh, and that's, that's why it's unique. It needs to be told, and, and thanks, Yashika, for doing that. Uh, and coming to the book, uh, I think I wanted to ask you on this point that you, know, you were pretty settled as a journalist when you started uh, kind of you know, working, uh, and then that's when you kind of, you know, 2016 happened, and it's a kind of a pivotal moment for most of the Dalit Bahujan Adivasi students, what happened to the Rohit Vemula. And then you decided to uh, kind of you know, come out as a Dalit. So I'm curious to know, uh, especially discussing with a larger audience, if, uh, you know, why, why did you decide to come out as a Dalit? Wouldn't have been all right just continuing to live your life, which was pretty successful at that time, working with some of the uh, great media houses in India. We'd like to know more about that. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, of course it could be all right. There is nothing wrong with not coming out as Dalit. There's nothing wrong with um, hiding your caste. And I know a lot of folks, especially people on Zoom, will heavily disagree with me. But this is how I feel. It's because I have lived that reality. And if I had continued to hide my caste, it would be totally okay. But after reading Rohit Vemula's last letter, and I would urge all of you to go back home and look it up, because those are one of the most significant words written for Dalits across the world. I would say it's the singular most important text written in English and Dalit literature that brought about this kind of change for so many people across the world. 
two of us are sitting right here. And when I moved to the US, I think I had already started that shift. That, you know, when I was living in India, it's like fish living in water. If you ask them what water is, they'll ask you what, you know, they won't know. But that's how we felt with caste. When you come to the US, it's when you realize that there are folks here who take these things seriously. Things that back home in India as Dalit people, we are told to laugh off, we are told to ignore, we are told that this is just what our lives are going to look like. When I moved to US, and I specifically when I moved to Colombia, I had the good fortune of attending classes with a really diverse set of students. A lot of them were queer, a lot of them were racially diverse, a lot of them were black women, black trans people. And I think from them, I learned how to use my voice. And I've said this before, and I want to really reiterate, a lot of this book is inspired by the work black folks have done in this country. And it continues to sort of give me the strength and lead me by example on how to do things. Because in India, we don't have a module to do that. So when I was here in those classes, I've written about this in the book, they asked us to write about you know, one of the worst things, the kind of experiences with discrimination that you faced. And I wrote about mine, but in kind of a mock way. Like, I, I was joking about it, but you know, look how bad it is in India. And when I narrated it in class, I still was saying it in a very tongue-cheek way. But my students, the, the students I was in class with, looked horrified. And it was when I saw the anger and the pain on their faces that reflected to me that what has been happening to, my, to me my entire life was wrong. That is when I realized that this caste system that we have been forced to live with, this hiding of identity, this burden that we live with, is a burden. It's like, you know, I write in the book, it becomes like a carcass, that you carry it on your back for so long that it fuses with your body, and then you refuse to see that it even exists until you see it in a mirror of someone else. And I think for me that process had already started, but Rohit's last letter was kind of the catalyst, which is, you know, and I want to sort of make it very clear, this was a process. It did not happen overnight. So those of you with Dalit folks who feel like they can just come out, of course you can, but this will take us some amount of work. And I was doing the work and when I read Rohit's letter, it seemed that I could no longer be silent because, you know, I was here at Columbia at a safe distance. I never talked about my identity. And here he was, this 26-year-old activist student whose mother was sewing clothes and sending him to school, sending him to college. And despite the inequality that he faced, he chose to use his voice. And that really struck me that, you know, that could have been me with just a few different permutations and combinations. And that's when I decided that I'm safe. I'm in the US. And of course, discrimination exists. But by then, I had guarded myself enough to not encounter it directly. I don't work in tech. I famously don't befriend a lot of South Asians. So <laughs> I just eliminated those possibilities. But that's how it was important for me to use my voice because there was nobody else to tell me how to do it. You know, when I looked at media, I'd worked in Indian media for a long time, and the only conversation that we heard there was about reservation, the affirmative action policy. And in pretty derogatory terms, they would say Dalits are grabbing the seats that they don't belong to them, that Dalits don't deserve to be in these places. And that's the only conversation I was aware of. So after Rohit's death, I wanted to create a different kind of conversation, where people like Rohit, people like myself, people like you, we could just convene and talk about how traumatizing it is to be a Dalit person, to be an Adivasi person, to have an oppressed caste identity, so that we don't have to wait, and not all of us have the privilege to be in a class in the United States where we can see on the faces of our classmates what trauma we've experienced. I wanted to create that space for all of us. 
And that's how the Tumblr documents of Dalit discrimination was born. And um, I realized that I can't ask people to share their stories unless I share mine. And that's where I wrote the note where I said, today I'm coming out as Dalit. Thank you, thank you. Yashika. Uh, going to the next point, I, I see when I also went to, like, you know, when I started studying, uh, my, I wanted to like study, I like chemistry, so I went to my dad and said, you know, I want to do something related to chemistry. He said, at that time, the only option was engineering. So chemistry became chemical engineering. But my father was always to the fact that, you know, he said, what is the best chemical engineering college in the India? So I think there is someone in our family who really titillates or supports that particular passion and directs it, even though he didn't know what was the best chemical engineering college. I see similar story with your mom, uh, uh, Srimati Shashidat, and she has been such an instrumental figure in your life. I mean, starting from sending you to uh, English medium private school, uh, and I think you have written in detail uh, kind of uh, trouble that has happened so as to go there, going to St. Stephen, and even while you were settled in your job as a journalist, I think it was she who wanted you to pursue masters and kind of, you know, apply outside and like, you know, coming to Columbia would have been such a big thing. So she really stood out in this book and, and I think she's as much as a kind of a central figure as much as you and it's such a, such a kind of, you know, relatable experience. Could you tell more about your, your mother and, and what does she feel seeing you today like this? Uh, thank you for that question. I think you accurately pointed out this book is as much about her, more about her than it is about me, in fact. It's more about her, it's more about Dalit folks everywhere. Um, I think this brings me to the point of how trauma and caste runs across generations. I want to talk about my own story. My mother's father was, um, he was not, in the manual scavenging profession. He studied to become a civil servant in India. His wife was in the manual scavenging profession. She supported him by doing the dehumanizing work that allowed him to study and give the exam and you know, create that officer position that so many of us who are Dalit in India really crave. And he achieved some amount of recognition with that, but that is, that's not where the work stops. And I've seen that in my family because when it came to my own family, suddenly this idea that we had to deal with so much led to mental health issues, led to patriarchal issues. My mother was not only fighting caste, she was fighting patriarchy within her own home. I want to, under, I want to underscore that I'm born in Rajasthan. Rajasthan, I've described it at a few places, think it's like as dry as Texas but in some ways even, you know, many ways, quite worse. Um, <laughs> you know, there is this insistence on giving birth to sons. Women, when we say second class citizens, in Rajasthan, that's fact. When I was born as the oldest child, it was a fact that I, by the virtue of my gender, I was never going to be good enough. I was not the person who was carry, going to carry the family name forward. And these are not abstract concepts. Maybe across India, they are diluted. Maybe across South Asia, they're diluted. But in Rajasthan, they're very fixed ideas. So when I was born, my mother decided that I would not have the life that she had led. And despite all her family members, and these are Dalit family folks who were telling her that she was somebody who only gave birth to daughters. She made sure that she brought up her two daughters. She, had, she has two, I have a younger sister as well and a younger brother. She made sure that she gave us equal upbringing. And it doesn't sound that radical in 2022, but in the early 90s and late 90s and early 2000s, it was a big deal. My mother made sure I never stepped in the kitchen, and as a result, I cannot cook and I cannot do housework. <laughs> but it was her own revolt, her own rebellion, because she didn't want her daughters to just be seen as caretakers. 
And also in India, especially in the north, especially in Rajasthan, girl children automatically not only become caretakers, they also become house helpers. They are the ones who are responsible with cleaning, cooking, taking care of younger children. We see that in families in the US as well. But especially back then, this is her way of asserting that my girls are not going to be any lesser than the boy that I'm raising. My grandfather, who, is, uh, who was one of the first civil servants from our caste in, the, in India, in that state, told her that she shouldn't send me to an English medium school because I'm a girl. And this is somebody who, is, who has achieved the recognition they have, but caste did not stop there. And my mother had to fight against all of that, being a woman herself, having two daughters, which meant the worst thing a woman could do is give birth to two daughters back to back. She can't even have sons. Forget that the DNA is determined by the father. You know, but, but despite all those ideas and the constant struggle, she made sure that I would always think of myself as somebody who was capable of achieving anything. And in order to give me that idea to, about myself, she had to literally rake herself through coals. And I have described it in some detail in the book, but it was a, an extremely difficult life. All throughout her life, her so-called friends said, Shashi, why are you doing this? Just choose the easy way out. And she said, no, I will send them to an expensive-ish in English medium convent school, because they are not going to be lesser than any other upper caste person. And also, in order to perform upper caste, you have to be among upper caste people. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, I've said that before, one of the reasons I'm here is not just because of my grandfathers who achieved a modicum of success, it's because of my mother, because that cycle, that chain could have broken with her if she did not strive for me to be where I am today. Yeah, Ashika, thank you. Uh, there are hundreds and thousands of those Dalit and Adivasi uh, people, I'm sure some of them are there on the Zoom right now, who haven't really come out with their identities. Uh, and some even have valid reasons for that. I've really spoken with them and like, you know, ex like explored this while I was also going through my own experiences. And I, I feel that everybody shouldn't be doing this. And there are valid reasons given the kind of society we live in. Uh, but I see it's a daily violence that they face by having to hide that identity. I really don't have like, words to express that. Uh, and, and I wasn't, like I was there not long ago, so I kind of relate to that. Uh, and, but I see that the way when I started seeing your tweets, Facebook posts during say Ambedkar Jayanti, uh, during many of these events, you used to be very particularly right to such people. At least it appealed to me at that time, maybe two or three years ago, your tweets, writing, and you were very empathetic and non-judgmental towards such people. You used to specifically write some of you who would not even explore, kind of you know, come out with their identity, but you know, I, I really care for you. So I, do you want to address something uh, for that particular section? And I do believe it's quite a large section of that society and we cannot even statistically say how many of them are because they haven't really come out. So do you really want to address something for those listeners who might see this video later also? Yeah, I think I was one of them. You were one of them for the longest time. And I, you know, I'll bear with me, I'm going to be a little nuanced here. Dalit movement is not new in India. Dalit movement is at least over 100 years old. And Ambedkar wrote his central thesis in Colombia in 1916, where he talked about caste. Even before that, the, you know, people were talking about caste. There was Peria, there was Fule, right? So this is not a new invention. What is new is how caste looks like in this day and age, and how people have evolved to survive the system that exists like the air that they breathe, right? How are we going to survive that? There are, in any movement, in any 
um, ideological space like that, even within the civil rights movement, even within you know, black folks and communities there, there is this idea about how should we express our identity. And there are different schools of thoughts. There will always be. When I came out as Dalit, a lot of people said, so what? We've been out, what's the big deal? And fair enough, to them it doesn't matter. But for me as a person, it meant, it meant everything. The fact that I was able to just say the fact that I was a Dalit person had a whole different meaning. It gave a new dimension to who I was. My cast is manual scavenging cast. It's bhangi. I can sit here and say this word in front of you today. Even just four years ago, I would be, I would be wrecked with anxiety even saying this word. That's the amount of trauma and shame caste gives you. So there are so many of us out there who are experiencing the shame and there are aspects of the ideological movement that doesn't address that. It's all about visibility. It's all about, you know, let's be a political force. And of course that's important, but how do we create a political movement while leaving so many of us behind? Somebody has to address that aspect of our communities. Somebody has to say, I see you, and there are so many of us out there, let us talk about it. Let us just have a safe space to process what it means to be a Dalit person even if you're hiding your caste. To not have the pressure to say, this is how you should be Dalit or there is only one way to be Dalit. I wanted and still want to, my effort will constantly be to talk about how being Dalit is a multi-dimensional identity. I want to talk about my mother. She is extremely religious. And I'm sure if a lot of people saw this on Twitter, which you know, I'm bracing myself for, it's going to be a point of contention. How can she be a Hindu? How can she practice Hinduism while being Dalit? That is antithetical to the movement. But that is just how she thinks. For her, being Brahmin or being perceived as Brahmin is the biggest rebellion. Who's going to go and tell somebody who's 65 years old that they're wrong and they're going to have to change their way of life? We can't do that. So I think it's worthwhile to address these nuances that exist within our communities and to talk about it and to create a space to talk about it. They're not bad people if they're not asserting themselves to be Dalit. They're still undergoing that trauma. They're still experiencing caste. And what's worse, they don't have a place to talk about it. In certain parts of the country, maybe the South, Maharashtra, it's easier to come out as Dalit. In places like Rajasthan, places like Uttar Pradesh, it's almost impossible. So we have to take all those nuances and have this larger conversation instead of having a unidimensional identity or a way to be a Dalit person. So if you are a Dalit person watching this and haven't come out, don't feel rushed. You don't have to, just read Ambedkar. So following up from that, uh, you know that some of the uh, responses that have been made to, uh, you know, to the attempts to draw attention to caste discrimination in the U.S. is that it is anti-Hindu and it is Hindu-phobic. I wonder how you would respond to that sort of assertion. That's made by some other caste people in this country. So I want to just address exactly what you said. The assertion made is that when you say something is casteist, you being anti-Hindu. Let's just walk back that logic a bit. What does that mean? I belong to a Hindu family. My mother is still a practicing Hindu. Am I allowed to talk about the discrimination I face or not while being a Hindu? Am I being Hindu phobic if I'm talking about my own family? How does that work? Who is Hindu phobic if I say that um, my mother, who wants to be the best Brahmin adjacent person she can be, and still facing discrimination, will the wider Hindu community accept her as Hindu or not? Is she Dalit? If she is Dalit, does she, ex does she have the same place as a Brahmin person? If she does not, because she is a Dalit woman, 
Does that mean a caste exists? If caste exists, then why can't we talk about it? This logic that organizations <laughs> that have enormous amounts of money in the United States, and let's like talk think about who are these organizations, these Hindu organizations, and how do they have money? Because they were the ones who were allowed to come here, had the access and the resources, 90, over 90% of new immigrants identify as upper caste Hindu, right? Studies have shown that. They came here, built off wealth, create an idea of Hinduism, poach the language from the civil rights movement, are anti-black, and then say, you're being racist when you talk about casteism. I'm a Hindu person, for example, and I'm not because I feel like I'm atheist, but I was born in a family. Can a Hindu person talk about the caste discrimination they face? Is that anti-Hindu? And I think it's a really nuanced question, and it's allowed to have this big ghost-like ideology around it. It's because people don't understand. It's because it's being um, hidden and erased within this idea of smokes and mirrors of religion. When you tell non-South Asians talking about caste is racist, nobody wants to be racist, right? So they won't talk about it. And that's just how you get them. And then you say, I'm a Hindu person. I tell you how you talk to me, what you talk to me about my religion. And then that's it, end of conversation. Talking about caste is not Hindu phobic because caste is a part of the religion. But it is also a part of the larger culture. Caste exists within Muslims in India. Caste exists within Christians in India. It's a socio-cultural reality. It started from a certain religion, but now it exists everywhere. So what are we going to do about it? Are we just going to sit here and say, even you mentioning the fact that you are a Dalit person is Hindu phobic, then what does it do to my rights as a human being, as a person who is an immigrant in this country? So I think what we need to do is unpack this idea of Hindu phobia, think and analyze who is talking about this, and really unpack what their argument is saying. What they're saying is, my religion divides us unequally. I want you to give me the freedom to keep treating people unequally, and I don't want you to talk about it. That's Hindu phobia, I guess. So following up on along those same lines, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the forms that caste discrimination takes here in the United States. You know, we've spoken a lot about the fact that it exists in Indian immigrant communities in the U.S., but how does it express itself in this different context? Arjun, it's not a different context. It's the same context. You take the same set of people from India, bring them to a different country, they bond within the communities, they perpetuate the same culture. That's the idea of multiculturalism in the US, right? Preserving culture. What is Indian culture? Caste. Outside of other things, food, dance, song, of course, but also caste, arranged marriages, which is ultimately a way to perpetuate caste. So it's not a different issue at all. I think. Folks in the U.S. need to understand that Indian communities in particular, a lot of diaspora, is not very different from folks back home. The issues, especially within Indian populations, are mirrored and parallel almost immediately because something that happens in India has reverberations here. Some, uh, you know, an Indian person faces discomfort, an attack of racism, it becomes a big news back home. These channels of transnationalism are very transparent and strong. So there is no difference between what happens in India and what happens here. People are the same, they have the same core beliefs, and they operate out of those core beliefs. Marriages in the United States that are arranged are arranged on the basis of caste. That is practicing casteism, right? Why do and I've talked about this, and people don't like when I say this. Why do people want arranged marriages? Why do Indian parents want to decide who their children should marry? And I just want to keep it on India, but South Asia in general has a caste issue. They want to decide who their kids want to marry so they can tell them which caste they should marry in. They can tell you it's the culture and the tradition. What they're talking about is caste. And we know that in arranged marriages are a big part of Indian culture. 
So how can we say caste doesn't exist here? In the workplace, it is a very direct issue. We've had incidents, I'm sure you've all read the report by Quality Labs, you've read the media that has come out of it. Men will pat other men on the back to see if they're wearing the sacred Brahmin thread. They will ask what your views are on Ambedkar. If you are pro-Ambedkar, that is another tell that you're a Dalit person. What are your views on affirmative action, on reservation? What was the rank that you got in these medical and engineering institutes? I talked about AIMS. AIMS has this ranking system. And that ranking system is divided on affirmative action category and general category. The affirmative action category has this particular ranking, which is very easy to identify. So if you're non-South Asian and somebody says, hey, what's your rank? Sounds like a benign question, but it's not, because it's an investigation into your caste without really asking what your caste is. Caste is very much here. It's in our networks, it's in our marriages, it's in our workplaces, it's in Dalits not being allowed to enter temples. And, you know, I, it's not very long ago that in early 2000s, right after 9-11, a Dalit family had a chuth written on their car. A chuth means untouchable. And they were worried that this was an attack by somebody um, who was being racist to them. They maybe didn't have to fear that so much. What they had to fear was their own community. I have actually one last question for you. Sure. And after that, I think we will throw the question time open to the audience. And I can already see uh, you know, the Zoom being populated with questions for you. So we want to leave enough time for that. But one of the most uh, striking things for me in your book was an incident you described at the University of Hyderabad where there was an upper caste professor who controlled a well and only students and faculty of high caste were allowed to drink from that well. And this was the case I think until 2014 when he retired. Um, and I found that quite astounding because even with all the problems we have with race in the United States, I cannot imagine a university, or in fact any place in the United States where you could have a whites only drinking fountain in this day and age. Perhaps I'm wrong, but you know, I, I, I have a hard time uh, imagining that. And so I was, the question I wanted to ask you, I know that you reviewed Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast and you wrote a generally very positive review. I would like to ask you what you make of her argument that the racial system in the United States is really a form of caste. Uh, you know, how do you respond to that? How do you see that? Yeah, I think this is a two-part question. I'll answer it quickly. So about finding it hard to imagine that discrimination on the basis of water can happen. It, it happened in the US not very long ago. And the reason it doesn't exist anymore, is, as I'm sure we all know, is because black people struggled and made sure that it wasn't going to happen anymore. In India, it's because we don't have any structures of power. Legally, caste is outlawed, untouchability is banned, but the institutional power all lies with upper caste people. It's not just in 2014. This was one well, this was one example. Water, this concept of who can touch water and what it does to that water when an untouchable person drinks it. That has been a question in India that is as fresh as last month. You know, we were talking about this earlier. This student, 10-year-old child in their Meghwal, he is from Rajasthan, same state that I'm from, was beaten to death by an upper caste teacher. And when I say beaten, I literally mean beaten. He was beaten so much that he passed away in a hospital because he touched the water vessel that was only meant to be reserved for upper caste folks, upper caste teachers. So it wasn't a whole well, but it was still a vessel of water. And Rajasthan can get extremely hot. This was the hottest summer on record, thanks to climate change. And that water vessel is the only way to have cool drinking water. Dalits don't have access to that cool drinking water or the right to drink water 
even today, especially in Rajasthan, which is facing drought. So you can imagine there is already, there is difficulty in accessing water. And even when you're able to do that, it's divided along the lines of caste. And it's not just one state. Everywhere in the country, water has always been this point of contention. So it's not hard to imagine. And about caste, the book, Wilkerson's book, I think it's a wonderful book. She is a talented writer. You can read the review. I love it. I've read it two times. And I learned a lot from it. But we have to uncomplicate this idea of whether race is caste or race is not caste. I think as, a, as an intellectual argument, as an academic argument, it sounds great in a way. Those are all systems of discrimination, whether Nazis Germany, whether how you know, black Americans are treated in the United States, or the Indian caste system. But the implications of those are vastly different. And slightly unpopular opinion, but ultimately even the United States is a first world country. It has enormous cultural power. What happens in the US resonates across the world. And thankfully, now thanks to social media, what happens in other spaces is also resonating here, but we have this massive protest going on in Iran. We don't see rallies of people in the US marching against that. But we do see when something happens, and rightfully so. It's wonderful that the attention that that gets, but it's unequal. So when we frame a specifically Indian issue that affects Indian people, that Indian people have worked so hard to erase, and then we frame it as an American issue, then it gets lost. In the book, I've talked about this in my critique as well, caste is a metaphor, Indian caste is a metaphor. The time that the writer has spent on exploring black American issues, as she should because that's what the book is about, and the time that she spent on exploring Nazi Germany because that's what Westerners can understand, is not the same time that she spent on Indian caste system, which is where the analogy was taken from that is a form of tokenization. We see her admiringly look at temples and shrines and talk about theology and religion, but we don't see her unpack what that religion does to Dalits and the caste system that she's addressing. And I think those issues are very important to discuss when we talk about race as a caste metaphor. Ultimately, we're not, I'm not an American citizen, so I have to fight very hard to get Dalit issues heard or talked about. And we have to form solidarities that are stronger and where the exchange of power happens equally. And I'm saying this with all due respect, but I think that power dimension has to be equal. And I don't even think it's the writer's fault. Publishers in the United States know what sell. What, what's going to sell, and that's what they include. So I think it's about this, it's a reflection of not what Isabel Wilkerson wanted to include, but what the publishers think is going to be popular, and it has been. So I think caste needs to have its own space because it's, it's a unique problem. It's an invisible issue. Race is visible, caste is not, and that's one of the most important differences and that's why they, in my opinion, are very hard to be seen on the same plane. And thank you for those views. And I think we now have, we have time for questions from the audience. Uh, we have a bunch of questions from the Zoom, uh, Zoom chat. So I think I might lead off by asking you a question from the Zoom chat. But there are mics circulating, or that will circulate. Yeah, okay, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay, so here's the question, uh, a, a question from you from a member of the Zoom audience. How is the rise of Hindu nationalism impacting Dalit people and their struggles for identity and access to rights? 
That's a great question, whoever asked. I think it's so incredible to talk about this because Hindu nationalism is not a recent issue. It's been around, we saw it rise first in the 90s, you know, and now it's taken a completely different dimension. The rights of Dalits, the, lights, the rights of Muslim people, the rights of Muslims in India, and the rights of minorities, the rights of activists are infringed. We are all under threat. But I do want to reiterate, Dalits have always been under threat. And I've written about this, so PEN America came out with an anthology called India at 75. And it included a lot of writers, Rusty including, um, to talk about what their idea of India is at 75 uh, years of independence. And I talked about how we've always been here. We've always been facing this inequality, this struggle that a lot of upper caste folks are now waking up to. So Hindutva and the rise of Hindutva is an extremely worrying problem, not just for India, but for the rest of the world. They are here, in our backyards, in the United States. Jersey, the state of New Jersey, the Democratic Party has called for an investigation. Very recently, I think yesterday, into the Hindu nationalist groups. Of course, they're a problem. But on the lives of Dalits, these, they haven't changed much. I mean, and you know, I'm happy to be corrected on this, Atrocities have become more visible, and of course crime has increased, but even within these spaces, there is discomfort to talk about caste. I was invited to a group where we had to put our heads together, big names of people, about what to do about Hindutva. And I said, you know, we should also talk about caste because they're interlinked. I was shut down. I was told, yeah, 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 we'll talk about this, but what about this first? Because that has always been the attitude among upper caste people, upper caste, quote unquote, dominant caste folks. That that's an issue that we can deal with when the time comes. But right now, this is the bigger problem. That's why caste has always been here, and this is not new. What people who are fighting Hindutva need to understand is that they need to learn from us on how to organize and how to tackle this, especially Dalit folks, because we've been at the front lines, and I, by we I mean the movement. I only came out in 2016 before Twitter gets to me. You know, Dalit folks have been at the front lines forever, and that's where you need to look at for inspiration to learn, but this is not new for all of us. Do we have a question? Do we have a question from the audience? Is there anybody? I think we have some questions from the front of the room. Hi, um, my question is with the new generation of American-born Indians. I'm an American-born Indian. Do you think they are more receptive to Dalits in general because of our education that we receive? And I know Growing up, the caste system was never taught right, and when it was, I was horrified. And do you think that the younger generation, the new generation, is more receptive to Dalits and welcoming them into the South Asian communities? Uh, thank you for that question. I think that's great. I would say no. <laughs> no, the reason I'm saying that is because young folks, all you have to do is look at South Asian TikTok. What's happening there? No one's talking about caste. All they're talking about is spirituality. All they're talking about is how to one up black people and claim a space that is ours and so we can say, hey, this is our culture, don't appropriate it. That's the only conversation that we talk about. When do we talk about caste? Where's the space to talk about caste? Young Hindu Americans, and I'm just going to single out that one community for a moment, are so protective of their spiritual identity that they don't want to engage with these questions of caste. And unfortunately, so this has been my experience looking at social media, look at speaking to people. I, it's really heartening that you asked me that question because it shows that you are receptive. And there are so many other students who are as well. 
all the organizing that's happening across the country, right? Uh, whether it's at California, University of Minnesota, it's happening with allies. It's not just Dalit students. It's young Indian American students who are doing it. But there are so few. There are so few and far in between. For us to say that the whole young generation is more receptive to caste and issues of caste would be incorrect because what they are more receptive to is displaying the fact that they're anti-caste is talking about the fact that they're anti-caste, not being anti-caste, it's now become a hot button issue, right? Since 2020 in particular, everybody wants to be anti-caste, but I've seen people come here, talk about um, being Ambedkarites, and then abuse Dalit people when no one's looking. And it's a lot of performativity. We see that in our communities, right? We see that within South Asian communities, it's a BLM in the streets. And, you know, and when they go back home, we know how they talk about black folks. So it's the same attitudes. Unfor I, the hope is that we get there soon. And I, I really hope that young Indian American folks who are listening to this pay attention, pay attention to how Hinduism is not just about colorful gods and yoga. You know, it's also about caste. Their culture is also about caste. I think there was a question over here. Um, hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm trying to decide which question to ask. Uh, uh, I think I'll ask the question that's easiest. How do you see the, the new movies that are coming out of, with Dalit film producers, anti-caste film producers, they're fundamentally changing aesthetic. I mean, I really enjoy them. How do you see that? I think that's a great movement, and uh, we've seen <clears throat> two or three big names who are Dalits. You know, Paranjit is one of them, Nagraj Manjule. I mean, Nagraj Manjule's history is complicated, but still, he's bringing forward the Dalit ideology. You know, Neeraj Kevin. These are just three names. Let's look at where Bollywood is going now. We have, you know, movies that are parroting government's ideology and then fighting about that movie being represented in the Oscars and then calling anyone who doesn't like that movie as anti-national. So that's why the general theme of Bollywood, it, and I'm just focusing on Bollywood right now. And of course, Paranjit is not a part of Bollywood, but at the same time, the anti-caste cinema that is coming out is coming out of regional cinema. It's coming out of outside the Hindi film industry that has dominated the, the world. The Hindi film industry, unfortunately, has had its legs completely cut off. The biggest stars are forced to parrot the party line, you know, and if they don't, we see what happened to Shah Rukh Khan and his son. So, is there hope? for a new kind of cinema to come out? Absolutely, because these three or four names, and they're hiring people who are Dalit, they're hiring people who are Bahujan, who are oppressed caste identities, and they're showing us that it can be done. But this is just the beginning. I think it's a great start, but also we have to look at it in the context of what's happening around us. Yashika, we have a question in the Zoom chat that takes us back to Wilkerson again. And the question is, on Wilkerson and the race-caste difference, despite the conceptual distinctions, what does an argument trying to see similarities between caste and race mean for politics? And by that I mean everyday politics of resisting discrimination and not necessarily social movement. And I, and, and I think if I might be able to interject something into that question, you and I were talking earlier about the Durban conference mm -hmm. and the fact that caste was excluded because it was not seen or not people did not agree that it was a form of racism. Mm -hmm. And therefore that could not be brought up. Wow, this is a thesis paper. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I- I'm giving ideas to somebody in the audience. <laughs> yeah, please write about this. No, I think this is such a great question. Thank you for asking this. Um, as a political tool, I think, you know, a lot of this starts with having nuance to these conversations. At least in my experience, ever since I've moved to the United States, 
we see that things tend to get painted with a very broad brush because we are trying to make a statement to a large group of people. And a lot of nuance, a lot of understanding gets lost. Um, also, I would like to address when they say social movements, but you know, not social movements, but only political, what are we talking about? Are we talking about solidarities between black politicians and upper caste Hindu politicians? Are they going to take up the idea of anti-caste politics? We have only one or two politicians who are even addressing caste, who are Hindu or who are Indian American. So it's a really difficult answer to think about at this moment because there are not many Dalits who are in the United States. So in terms of forming political power, I don't think we have the numbers. We don't have, are we ready for a Dalit senator from the US? I'm, you know, maybe we can answer that question in the next five years. But right now, we, we don't know. So for now, with so few of us here, when the movement just starting, for folks like, you know, us having to just explain what caste is, I think we have to start with the reality of a social movement because only then we can pivot to something political, something that can change things. But we have to create awareness and understanding. So many minority folks and people from minority communities gravitate to an alternate spirituality, gravitate to Hinduism because that's not the oppressive religious dogma that they grew up with. But they also don't understand what Hinduism brings. So that's what, and I, I don't want to just single out Hinduism, I want to talk about Indian culture in general. What does that bring? It looks really great and it has a lot to offer. I mean, I am proud of the, the arts that we give to the world. I am proud of the music and the dance and the food. But at the same time, it's really important to dissect those ideas and also think about what social movements can do in terms of creating bonds of solidarity between oppressed people, between black folks, between native folks. They need to understand caste first before we talk about political solidarities. I think this is the very beginning of one of the biggest, newest, human rights struggles that is finally getting talked about. And also one of the oldest human rights struggles because it's a thousand years old. But finally it's getting the time that it deserves. Mm -hmm. I have a question here in the Zoom chat. What according to you would be the most important actions for allegedly well-meaning upper caste Hindus to take to start being more effective allies to Dalits? Great question. Should Look, I repeat that? I had I didn't have my mic on, sorry. I keep forgetting. <laughs> I'll answer that question. What can well-meaning upper caste Hindu allies do? We don't need your help as Dalit people. And I don't want to be a spokesperson for everybody, but I do want to say we'll be fine. Talk to your own families. Look within your own family groups, your WhatsApp groups, the caste slurs, the jokes, the idea that this is okay the anti-reservation statement. Do it, fight your battles there. That's how you're being a good ally. Of course, recognizing your own place in casteism is a start, but really expand it to your own family networks, to your friends. Stand up for Dalit people. Make it a safe space for Dalit people that even those who are not coming out, who are not expressing their identity, know that they have an ally, they have a friend in you, that they Feel empowered to speak up. Empower your friends who might or might not be Dalit, might or might not be Adivasi, to speak up about what they're facing by creating safe space. In India, in Indian cultures, in our societies and communities, caste is so taken for granted that we have to really start from the bottom level. Have to really start peeling one layer by hand, painstakingly, so we create these conversations that haven't existed. There's a question in the audience. Back there. Hi, um, 
my question is, what have been some of like the economic implications or like effects that you can see now, like more, more so on like a local level of the caste system like in modern day India? Thank you for asking that question. So you mean the economic implications of, of the caste system? Effects, or like Effects. some disparities that you can see now. Oh, that's, I understand what you're saying. Okay, that's a terrific question. I think I'd like to address it by talking about class and caste. You know, the way we understand it in India, caste and class are very much parallel. If you have money, you must be upper caste. And if you don't have money, you must be Dalit. The reality is it's not as simple in India. There are so many poor people, impoverished people, who are Brahmin. There are very few, but still, some Dalit people who are middle class. So caste and class are not the same. But at the same time, the access to opportunity within the same class level is still defined on the basis of caste. So, for example, if there are two people from the same economic subset, one is Dalit person, one is Brahmin, you don't even have to guess who's going to get the opportunity. Who will find it easier to come out of that poverty? Who will find it easier to start a business? Just by way of example, I grew up um, with a lot of income inequality. And my mother tried to start a lot of businesses, you know, just to support ourselves. My father is an alcoholic, did not work, despite his father doing relatively well. So this is how intergenerational trauma of caste works. And one of the businesses she tried to start was making, having a food truck. It was an extremely daring thing to do in the 90s, especially a woman. And that did not work because we were Dalit. Everybody knew what our caste was. Nobody would have food that was made by a manual scavenging caste person. Nobody would touch the food made by a bhangi person. That business flopped. We didn't, like my mom obviously, not even knowing having business acumen, because in India, business acumen is divided on the basis of caste. Business know-how is relegated to a certain caste. And Dalits, we don't have any understanding of how to run a business. And that business didn't work, because who was going to make food eat touched by a Dalit? And if a Brahmin woman did that, she would have ran five restaurants by now. And that's how class and caste work very differently. And of course, we've been independent for 75 years. India is a progressing nation. Everybody has benefited from that, but everybody has benefited from it unequally. I hope that answers. Uh, Yashika, you're amazing, so that's just... Um, I, so, um, you know, you, you talk about nuance in sort of understanding caste and sort of being careful about uh, drawing parallels, easy parallels or easy relationships between race and caste. And I was wondering um, how you sort of look at, you know, the, the, the phrase made famous by Ambedkar, which is that caste is a system of graded hierarchy. Right, um, which sort of points to, and that was at least my sort of my issue with Wilkerson's book is that those kinds of divisions are not, at least to the extent that I understand race, and I'm definitely not, you know, uh, there's a lot uh, to learn there, but that kind of gradation is not something that you see. Um, as much in, you know, in discussions around race and the experience around race. Um, so I'm wondering how you look at that, which includes uh, the, you know, the difficult question of divisions even among Dalit communities. Uh, and there are some very strong hierarchies there as well. And uh, what the political in implications of that are, because they can be politically debilitating uh, to even actually talk about that in a moment such as this, but um, yeah, just generally, uh, you know, w do you think about it? What do you think about it? 
Thank That's you. a really great question. I'm really glad you asked that. Thank you. Um, I think you made the argument for why race is not caste. Because caste is extremely multidimensional. Um, there is graded hierarchy, even within Dalits. Even within Dalits, there is a lowest of the low. The caste that I talked about, Chamar, who deal with dead animals, think they're superior to the caste that I'm from. A Chamar person would not marry somebody who's a bhangi. They would not go to somebody's house who's a bhangi because they would think that they are superior. That kind of graded inequality is a conversation that we only see within caste. We don't see that conversation within race because, again, race is visible. The differentiator that exists is of skin, of skin color. You know, it's, you see it. Caste, you don't. And that's why the complications can be so much more. And which is why these, it's good for us to form solidarities. It's necessary for us and vital for a survival to form solidarities. But it's not okay for us to equate one to the other. It's a disservice to everybody. It's a disservice to um, people who are interested in learning about caste because they want to know what it really looks like. Let's tell them what it really looks like. And I think, you know, when we form political movements, everybody has a different job. People who are forming political movements want to galvanize everybody. People who want to think, think through these issues in a nuanced and deep way, it is our responsibility to talk about everything and all its implications. And that's why I think that's a great argument, why race is not caste, because you know, even within a lower caste, there are subdivisions. So. Any more questions from the audience? And I will check uh, the Zoom. I think I exhausted them. But <laughs> <laughs> um, well, here's a question that I will toss out for you. Yes, you got to see what you would like to do with it. How do you see the process of hiding the Brahminical identity, not privilege, vis-a-vis -vis what you did until you came out as Dalit? To provide a context, sorry, let me repeat that. How do you see the process of hiding the Brahminical identity, not privilege, vis-a-vis -vis what you did until you came out as Dalit? Uh, oh dear, what happened there? Uh, the, Question suddenly disappeared. And this is one of the, oh, there we go. Uh, to provide a context, several folks in socialist, Marxist, feminist movements tend to hide their Varna caste to make strides and to hog non-deserving leadership positions without actual experience of discrimination. Basically missing that praxis or rather maintaining privileges even within the culture of friction. Oh, that's such a great question because I was thinking it was going to go a completely different way. I'm really glad it landed where it did. <laughs> um, yeah, great question there. Um, but they're completely different experiences, right? If you're a Brahmin person, you're pretending to be oppressed, what do you have to lose? I mean, what does Rachel Dolezal have to lose by being transracial activist? Nothing except her pride and dignity. But, you know, outside of that, it's really, there's, there's not much at stake. When you're a Dalit person, you're hiding your identity, you're getting into someone else's skin. And not only that, you're being told every day that you are not worthy of deserving enough to be in your own skin. And you have to deal with the shame and the trauma that that comes with. Those are completely different experiences. And you know, when you're at the bottom and you're trying to go up, that is a much difficult process than somebody who's already privileged and pretending to have moments of oppression, which is not to say that they, they might not have. I'm, you know, upper caste women are victims of patriarchy and they, their experiences are valid. But it's, those are two entirely different kinds of, I, I wouldn't even say that's passing, that is um, taking advantage of a system with the, the, that has certain flaws, 
And because you're present, you can take advantage of them because you know how to work around the system and Dalits don't have the access or understanding. Many, many of us don't or are kept out of it. So I think this is, this is wonderful, but they don't, there is no intersection between those experiences in my opinion. The person who asked that question, Vishal, also I think wants to know what you think about that issue as well. Just repeat it once. So the, the question, as I understand it, is how do you see the process of hiding the Brahminical identity, not privilege, vis-a-vis -vis what uh, Yashika did, well, or perhaps including you too, uh, until you came out as Dalit. And then to provide a context, several folk in socialist, Marxist, feminist movements tend to hide their Varna caste to make strides and to hog non-deserving leadership positions, presumably, without actual experience of discrimination, basically missing that praxis or rather maintaining privileges even within the culture of friction. I think I specifically say it from the non-profit sector where I work. I have a very kind of a long haul in that sector. And you would see most of these organizations taking that context come from these Gandhian utopian idea that if you go to the community, if you work with them, even though they are Dalit and Adivasis, uh, you know, with that just nice gesture of going into the community will solve the problem. But many a times they kind of, you know, see this, even the Dalit Adivasi communities are seen clumped together, even though there are so many variations among them, right? They are not equal, same to like the race caste issue. Caste and indigeneity are not equal issues. You can't equate that. So I feel their non-nuanced understanding about caste, indigeneity, and just this notion that we are doing good for the society kind of takes away this critical understanding. And then eventually what happens is they kind of take the projects which are there, or means the kind of a colonization that happens, whatever has worked maybe in US or maybe in other global south countries, they take those ideas and copy paste it to an Indian context, which might be totally aligned to that. So I guess in that particular context, I would say that not having that, and eventually it happens that you will see the board members of these organizations, the leadership, executive leadership, the management committees, you would hardly find, I bet you, there are hardly like 1% organizations, non-profit, supposedly, forget corporates and the government organizations, but at least these supposedly organizations who work for the benefit of Dalit and Adivasi communities don't have at times single Dalit and Adivasi students in their leadership. If you ask them these questions, why don't you have Dalit and Adivasi as board members or your executive directors, they say it will take time to come for them to come there. But what are you doing for them to come to that leadership position? How are you grooming them differently? And I think that's, these are the questions which they ask. And again, this is because they don't have understanding of caste, the nuance understanding, even forget nuance, even they don't have understanding of caste. And that's why they kind of tend to replicate that. And there's no kind of a way to reflect. Even if you ask them questions, they'll reflect, deflect it rather than kind of you know, facing those questions. And I, I was really frustrated to be in that sector. And that's why I made it a move. It's certainly not that academia is purely clean or is devoid of all that. But at least here you get to talk about these issues and reflect and talk that and critique that. It gives you a forum. But of course, this also space needs to revamp itself remarkably. And thank you, Vishal. And thank you very much, Yashika. I think we have now run out of time. So if any of you had questions you wanted to ask Yashka, I'm sorry. Uh, perhaps <laughs> you can come and ask her after, uh, after we, we end. But I'd like you all to join me in thanking Yashika and Vishal for being here.